Hello, I'm Christopher Rowley. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry at the Memorial University of Newfoundland. And in this webinar, I'm going to be discussing the charm uh, turbomol QMMM interface developed in our group. What charm turbomol is, is a QMMM interface between the charm molecular mechanical code and the turbomol quantum mechanical code. So this is a module implemented within CHARM that will ex execute TurboMol to calculate the energy and forces for QM regions of the model within CHARM uh, and then uses these forces and energies to perform various molecular simulations. The QMMM uh, implementation follows a kind of conventional electrostatic coupling scheme where the QM calculation is performed under the presence of the uh, partial atomic charges of the MM atoms and so the QM region is polarized by the MM atoms and the forces between uh, the forces of the QM region on the MM atoms are also incorporated into the simulation and so this is a uh, electrostatic coupling through the uh, calculation of the QM forces. You can read up more about our code on our group website and also in the article uh, published recently in the Journal of Computational Chemistry. So in terms of why our code interfaces to specifically the CHARM molecular mechanical uh, code, uh, there's several reasons for this. Even though CHARM is a somewhat older code, it actually has fairly robust support for QMMM calculations. Uh, CHARM also has support for both not polarizable and non-polarizable force fields that are fairly mature. Uh, specifically for proteins, nucleic acids, and also a number of molecular liquids. It also supports the Drude polarizable force field that we'll discuss in a little bit more detail in a moment. That allows us to do uh, QMMM molecular dynamics where a, the molecular mechanical region is also polarizable. There's also sophisticated restraints and constraints available within CHARM, so it's fairly uh, straightforward to configure a uh, fairly complex molecular mechanical and quantum mechanical hybrid model uh, using these various features, uh, such as spherical boundary conditions, harmonic restraints, shake, and other type uh, simulation algorithms. Also, there's extensive a number of different molecular dynamics integrators, so various integration schemes, also uh, support for various thermostats and so some of the uh, more onerous implementations of different uh, thermostatting schemes doesn't have to be done from scratch within this code. Charm TurboMole certainly isn't the first QMMM interface within Charm. So these goes back to the early 90s when there was interfaces to Games US and Games UK. Since then, there's been implementations to connect Charm to tight binding DFT methods developed by Chang Sui's group. Also, there's more recent ones to more conventional QMM, uh, QM codes, such as QChem, Gaussian 09, and Demon. And so Turmol is just the last on, on, in a large set of different codes. And so there's actually a large number of codes that you can interface with Charm now. The justification I would give for adding yet another QMMM interface to Charm is the same reason why we have all these different QM codes to begin with. Each of these codes has a particular set of features and advantages that uh, provide different functionality. And by interfacing them to, Q, uh, to molecular mechanical codes, that makes these available for QMMM simulations. And so adding Charm TurboMol allows us to access what's uniquely advantageous to Charm uh, with TurboMol. So specifically what we can address using Charm TurboMol is issues with sampling and accuracy of methods. So when we have a reasonably complex system, in order to uh, perform a simulation that's long enough to say something quantitative about it, we would need to do convergent sampling, where we've simulated the sim system long enough so that we can get a distribution of a certain property uh, to a significant degree of statistical convergence. And just as a rule of thumb, for most systems of chemical interest, we would need at least 100 picosecond simulations to do this amount of sampling. In order to do QMMM simulations that are this length, traditionally people have performed these using uh, relatively inexpensive QM methods. So for instance, semi-empirical methods like DFT, type bonding methods like SCC DFTB, uh, or EVB method. The disadvantage of doing this is that many of these semi-empirical methods uh, have limitations in terms of what kind of system we can use to describe this. So if we're dealing some, with something where intermolecular interactions are very important or we have uh, transition metals or complex reaction mechanisms, 
these methods will not necessarily be very effective unless they're reparameterized for the specific uh, kind of system. Now, the way around this is to use kind of more conventional DFT. So this is kind of B3LYP or uh, MP2. So DFT methods that we know are reasonably accurate for these systems, and we can benchmark uh, and demonstrate that their properties for, uh, uh, kind of, for instance, gas phase reactions are accurate. In order to do these, they come at a greater cost. And so we have to compromise and typically use either a smaller QM region or a smaller basis set or reduce our sampling to a shorter simulation where we wouldn't necessarily be confident that we've sampled to a convergence. So the advantage that Turbomol provides is that they have very fast and robust DFT and post hartree fock uh, wave function methods, uh, specifically using the resolution, of the, uh, the resolution of identity approximation that provides very fast evaluation of Coulomb and exchange integrals. There is also efficient SMP parallelization that, for, so for at least a mid-size system of, you know, 10 to 20 atoms, uh, there's very efficient simulations that can be done using uh, Turbomol. Uh, also, that the, these, this resolution of identity allows us to do uh, fast, uh, self-consistent field and gradient calculations, even if we're using a fairly complete basis set. So, for instance, the simulations that I'm going to be presenting later in this talk uh, typically use a triple zeta basis set. So, uh, if you look at many of the simulations done using earlier QMMM codes, they're, if they're doing conventional DFT methods or conventional wave function methods, they're typically also using a relatively small basis set in order to uh, run long simulations. So uh, this creates a limitation in the accuracy due to basis set incompleteness. And But with Turbomol, we can use conventional DFT or wave function methods and still use accurate basis sets. And this Q QM method is sufficiently fast that we can do long QMMM MD simulations and get kind of to our convergence samplings. Uh, and what I'll also speak about is the kind of fairly sophisticated and uh, very fast implementations of calculations for excited state properties, which is another unique feature of Turbomol. So how our implementation is performed is that we implement a charm Turbomol interface into a module, so the, specifically the GUK INI module of charm, where when a QM region is designated within the calculation, a every time a energy and force calculation is invoked, so some step within ch charm dynamics minimization or Monte Carlo requires either the energy or the forces of the atoms, it'll call a routine and it'll identify that there's a QM region as part of the system. And under those situations, this will trigger the charm turbomol interface. So when an or energy or force evaluation is called by charm, and there's a QM region, charm will write the MM point charges and QM coordination coordinates to disk. Uh, and then we use a Python script to interface between charm and turbomol. And so this allows us to deploy and uh, change our options to execute turbomol fairly uh, simply. And so this is a little bit easier than card coding a lot of these features directly into charm. What the Python script does is uh, takes these coordinates that were written by charm and uh, configure uh, input files and temporary directories based on these inputs, and then it, it executes Turbomol. And so the Python script is actually what runs Turbomol itself. Turbomol calculates the energy and forces based on the input coordinates uh, and input files. And then after these files are written to disk, this script will exit and then uh, charm will resume. And when charm resumes, it will read in the QM energy and forces and use those energy and forces within their simulation cycle. One of the examples we'll present uh, that we've used our charm turbomol code for is simulations of ion solvation. These are very interesting systems to look at using QMMM methods uh, because ions have very complex interactions with their solvents and molecular dynamic simulations can give us a lot of insight into uh, what the nature of these interactions are. However, because uh, we don't have good parameters for uh, ion-water uh, interactions all the time, or we would like to validate the parameters for a molecular mechanical ion-water model, uh, QMMM methods uh, can provide us a lot of extra information on the interaction of these ions and water. And there's also a very natural description of these systems within a QMMM framework. 
So we can designate the ion and the first coordination sphere of solvent molecules to use using a QMMM model, to using a, our QM model. And then the remainder of the system of the water molecules outside this first coordination sphere can be described using a molecular mechanical model. So when we do the simulation, typically we're doing uh, spherical boundary conditions. So uh, all the term terminal simulations uh, have to be done performing uh, using a uh, finite system. And so periodic boundary con conditions are not implemented. So uh, typically we're looking at systems where we have our QM region at the center of a sphere of a remaining of the system being an MM model. And in this case, we have a 14 angstrom water sphere where the uh, ion and first coordination sphere of waters are the first are at the center of, uh, or at the origin of that system. And then we go out 14 angstroms using an MM model. And this creates a approximation in that we're truncating long range electrostatic forces uh, between the ion and waters that would be more distant than the 14 angstroms of our simulation. Uh, this is uh, typically for the properties that we'll be calculating, not a serious issue. One of the advantages of using Charm Turbomol is that we, there's a straightforward way of doing QMMM simulations where the MM region is polarizable. In these examples, we're using a QM region that's modeled with a DFT or ab initio model, specifically the PBE DFT functional, the PBE zero hybrid DFT functional, or the resolution of identity implementation of MP2. And in each case, we use this triple zeta uh, basis set def2 tzvpp. But for the MM region, we're using a polarizable SWIM4 NDP water model. So this is the Drood polarizable model of water developed by Guillaume Lamoureux. In this model, it's the water model is represented using three atomic sites, uh, the two hydrogens and the oxygen, and an additional uh, off uh, center lone pair site OM. And so this is typical of a four site water, for instance, tip 4P. What makes the model polarizable is this red particle here, it, which is the, the Drood particle. This is a uh, small or effectively very light particle that moves in response to an external electric field. And so this Drude particle effectively mimics the induced polarization of electron density due to an external electric field. In this example, we have a potassium ion that will be positively charged. And when it moves around the water model, this Drude particle will move in response to that, effectively changing the dipole moment of this water mo model to reflect its new electric field. And so as the potassium ion moves around the water, this Drude particle is pulled along with it, and there, by that way, we kind of mimic the effect of induced polarization. This kind of scheme is very convenient for QMMM simulations, because in the Drude model, the positions of the Drude particles are typically propagated dynamically, so they're moving with the heavy atoms over the course of the simulation uh, by assigning them a fairly small uh, fictitious mass that's taken off of the parent atom. So when we do QMMM simulations, instead of having to do simultaneous SCF of the Drood positions and the wave function of the QM region, we can just propagate these Drood particles dynamically. And so this is a significant uh, savings in both computational cost and the complexity of our implementation, because we don't need to make any modifications to our QM uh, program in order to do this. And this is the MM model that we've used in our hydration simulations. So in this example, we've calculated the hydration structure of magnesium and zinc in uh, a polarizable solution of water. So the first coordination sphere of the first six water molecules that are coordinated to the ion are represented using a QM model. So shown here uh, in blue are the six coordinated water molecules forming an octahedral coordination sphere around the ion uh, with the ion at the center. So over the course of the simulation, the QM region will undergo fluctuations in terms of the movement, but it preserves this octahedral six coordinate coordination mode very, uh, actually quite closely. The significant thing here is when we look at the radial distribution function, the QM models consistently give a 
coordination structure that is octahedral with oxygen ion distances near 2.1 angstroms. And this is consistent with experimental data, plus uh, also previous uh, non-polarizable and polarizable uh, molecular mechanical models. So this confirms to some degree the uh, solution structure of these ions, at least their inner coordination sphere is, is well described using these models. Beyond a conventional QMMMD simulation that can give us thermally average structures of the ions in solution, we can also calculate the relative hydration free energies of these ions using a technique called thermodynamic integration. So this is an alchemical free energy technique where we define the system uh, based on two different compositions and we'll compute the free energy of transforming between these two compositions. The first system is described uh, where magnesium is at the center of our inner coordination sphere, and the second system is described where the zinc is at the center of the first coordination sphere. Then we define a coupling parameter, lambda, that we vary between 0 and 1, and a new potential uh, that's designed, defined in terms of lambda of u lambda, and it, this is expressed as this function here. What this function does is, as the value of lambda is changed between 0 and 1, the potential transforms between a representation using magnesium and the representation using zinc. So when the simulation is performed using lambda equals to zero, the system reflects a simulation with magnesium at the center of the coordination sphere. Then when we have uh, changed the value of lambda to lambda equals to one, our system is now described entirely as a zinc system. And at intermediate values, we have this kind of hybrid of somewhere between the magnesium and zinc definitions. So the potential energy is simply a linear combination of these two values, and therefore the forces acting on the atoms are just a linear combination of our uh, calculated forces based on uh, the system calculated using magnesium at the center and also uh, calculated using zinc at the center. What we can do with this definition is if we were to take the, def the derivative of u lambda with respect to lambda and integrate between zero and lambda with respect to lambda, that is equal to the relative free energy of these two ions. And so essentially we've transformed between these two states alchemically and that gives us the relative hydration free energy of these ions. The advantage of calculating free energies in this manner is that we avoid any kind of implicit solvation or harmonic approximation definitions, and we're computing uh, relative free energies based on thermal averages. And so this is perhaps a more powerful way of calculating uh, relative free energies in situations that we can't use some, some of these simplifying approximations. The advantages of calculating relative solvation free energies is that the experimental relative hydration free energies are well known, so we can compare this value fairly uh, directly to experiment. So the, to do these simulations we performed an equilibration for 11 different windows with values ranging between lambda equals 0 and lambda equals to 1, and sampled 15 picoseconds of QMMM molecular dynamics for these, uh, each of these windows. Just to note, to get at the relative hydration free energy, we calculate the absolute electronic energy of the two gas phase ions, magnesium and zinc, and we subtract the difference in electronic energy of these two isolated ions from our net uh, hydration free energy. And so this is what gives us the relative hydration free energy and removes a part of the energy that purely reflects the different electronic states of the two ions.
To get an idea of the computational cost of these simulations, we performed benchmark QMMM MD simulations of just 100 time steps using three different quantum methods on this QMMM MD simulation of uh, hexacoordinate magnesium in a uh, polarizable MM solvent. Uh, and in each case, we're using the DEF2 TZVPP basis set. So our fastest simulations are using the pure hybrid, uh, pure DFT functional PBE. Uh, so this is a significantly reduced cost because there's no uh, there's no exchange integrals to calculate, and so the resolution of identity is very uh, efficient here. Surprisingly, at least for this relatively small simulation, uh, performing an MD simulation using PBE zero, so a hybrid functional is only incrementally more expensive. So for small systems like this, it's completely reasonable to do uh, to do simulations using a hybrid functional like PBE0 or B3LYP. Uh, and this is a significant advantage over uh, techniques like uh, plane wave basis set methods, let's say CPMD, where it's very expensive to do uh, exchange integrals. Uh, but for the right uh, kind of the right systems, we can do hybrid uh, DFT MD simulations using uh, TurboMole really quite efficiently. Now, if we switch over to a wave function method, for instance, RIMP2, uh, it is considerably more expensive. So we see about a six-fold increase in the computational cost. Uh, so for 100 picoseconds to do this kind of MD simulation, it would take uh, a little bit over a month to do uh, the PBE simulations, two months to do the PBE zero simulations, uh, and the better part of a year to do the MP2 simulations. But if you automate the submission of these calculations and just kind of set them running on a supercomputer, uh, we can get up to really sim significant simulation times, even for sizable systems, uh, if we just wait long enough. So uh, in my mind, that these are totally tractable simulations where we can do this kind of uh, high quality QM calculation using fairly long time scales. Uh, provided we wait long enough, we can just uh, run enough sampling to do something kind of uh, quantitatively meaningful calculations uh, using uh, kind of uh, conventional uh, DFT methods that are relatively accurate. One interesting thing we can do with Charm TurboMole is also to calculate the properties of excited electronic states, and specifically looking at the effects of dynamics on electronic absorption spectra. So there's a couple of interesting features that we can start looking at using this kind of methodology. One is the effect of molecular vibrations on electronic absorption spectra. So at higher temperatures, we tend to have broader uh, electronic absorption peaks. Uh, what this is reflecting is that the uh, in these at these higher temperatures, we have more molecular vibrations that are leading to a greater variety in electronic uh, structures. And because we've perturbed our electronic energy levels by these uh, molecular vibrations, we see broadening in the ultimate peaks that arise because of these transitions. Another interesting thing, feature that we can include is the effect of solvation on our uh, electronic spectra. So solvents will have uh, effects on electronic absorption spectra from a couple of different uh, origins. One, we can see either a blue or red shift in the absorption spectra, depending on whether or not the ground or excited state of our molecule uh, of the chromophore is preferentially stabilized by the solvent. So depending on the dielectric uh, constant of the solvent and the polarity of our chromophore the ground and excited states, we can see either a red or a blue shift. What's more is that there's even further broadening of electronic absorption peaks uh, in solution. And so this is reflecting that there's this really enormous configurational variety of a solvent around a solute. And this has the effect of, again, perturbing our energy levels so there's greater variety in the transitions that can occur. And so QMMMD simulations can intrinsically give us this kind of information. By performing an MD simulation with an explicit solvent and calculating the electronic absorption spectra at a number of different configurations uh, on this trajectory, we can calculate these spectra from kind of from first principles and include these effects. So in this example, we've calculated the electronic absorption spectra of indole, and this is actually in pretty reasonable agreement with experiment. And just to illustrate this effect of peak broadening, this is one of the transitions uh, that occurs around 280 wave number uh, 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 nanometer uh, wavelengths. And there's a really enormous kind of broadening in the 
uh, frequencies at which this uh, transition will occur. So we see a really huge range of wavelengths between 270 nanometers and 300 nanometers uh, that this transition can occur at when we have both the effect of vibrational uh, temperature, so molecular vibrations within the chromophore of indole, and also the perturbing effects of our solvent around it. One other interesting thing we can do using charm turbomol is to do molecular dynamics on excited electronic states of molecules. So this is made possible by the E grad module of turbomol, which calculates the forces and energies of excited states. So we can use these forces uh, within a uh, QMMMD simulation to uh, uh, perform MD simulations on this excited state surface. Now this is commonly done when we're doing kind of surface hopping MD simulations where over the course of an MD simulation the trajectory will transition between uh, ground and various excited electronic states. So this kind of non-adiabatic MD simulation uh, is not a straightforward method because it's, it's really a radically different technique than the kind of uh, ground state born Oppenheimer molecular dynamics performed conventionally using charm. Uh, and so this, to implement this kind of method it would require really significant modifications to charm. However, if we restrict ourselves to situations where we have just very long-lived excited states, uh, so for instance the uh, ground excited state, uh, the first excited state of indole, uh, has lifetimes of up to uh, microseconds. And so we can do uh, MD simulations of this excited state and sample its various uh, uh, configurations and emission spectra. Uh, and with some confidence that it won't relax down to the ground state in the time scale of our simulation. So we can just use conventional uh, molecular dynamics on this excited state and from this, uh, from this trajectory we can calculate its emission spectra. Uh, and this is what's shown in this plot here, where we've calculated the absorption and also the emission spectra by simulating the first excited state. Uh, interestingly enough, the excited state was actually uh, calculated with somewhat more accuracy than our ground state, which is uh, probably just a fortuitous error. But uh, it seems reasonable that provided we have uh, these long-lived excited states, it's actually really quite straightforward to do this kind of explicit solvent uh, extended MD simulation using this. And implicitly, there's the assumption that uh, these excited states are sufficiently long-lived that we're going to have uh, an equilibrium Boltzmann distribution of states uh, occupied uh, in these excited states. So they, we're looking at systems where they're considerably longer lived than their relaxation times uh, to their uh, equilibrium structures within their excited states. So to give an indication of the computational cost of these simulations, again, we've done 100 uh, time-step MD simulations. Uh, and then th these benchmarks correspond to the uh, simulation of indole in an aqueous uh, solution. Uh, using, In this case, we're just using the def uh, SVP basis set. So this is only a double zeta basis set. So the uh, wall times are somewhat uh, smaller. Uh, in any case, uh, the comparison is in each case is compared to just a uh, equilibrium ground state MD simulation, uh, and if we were to do this, it would take about 25 minutes of wall time to do 100 MD steps. Now, if we also calculate the excited state properties of our uh, along this kind of Born-Oppenheimer simulation of the ground state, then we see kind of a uh, twofold increase in the cost of the simulation, and so there is a considerable cost associated with calculating these excited state properties. If we perform this kind of uh, adiabatic simulation of the excited state where we're also calculating the excited state energies and gradients using E grad, uh, we see a four times more expensive simulation. And so to calculate an emission spectra, we can expect the cost of the simulation would be a four, about four times larger. Uh, and so again, this is a significant increase in cost, but it is still tractable. So if we can simulate the ground state, we're very likely to be also be able to simulate uh, either these excited state properties or even an excited state MD simulation, at least for these kind of relatively small chromophores. One other really powerful feature of charm turmoil is in the calculation of electronic circular dichroism spectra. Uh, and so this is dealing with situations where uh, left and right circularly polarized light will be observed with 
absorb with different probability in octave, optically active materials. Uh, and so significantly, chiral molecules will have uh, different signs depending on their absolute uh, chirality, will have different signs on the uh, rotational strength of uh, their uh, ECD spectra. And so in principle, this could be used to determine the absolute stereochemistry of a molecule. And so in this spectra, we see kind of the calculated and experimental uh, ECD spectra of uh, this molecule, the two enantiomers of this molecule. Uh, and so the difficulty is that the complexity of these structures, particularly in solution, is really quite complex. And so uh, calculating these properties is relatively difficult. And this is discussed in some detail in a recent uh, uh, Wires Computational Molecular Science Review by Philip Fersha. So the reason why these ECD spectra are so sensitive to uh, solvent and uh, vibrational effects is because the uh, rotational strength and absorption energies can really vary uh, quite considerably over the course of an MT simulation. And so these environmental effects are really significant for these properties. To illustrate this, we've plotted uh, the rotational strength and lambda from one of the transitions of this molecule in this color map here. And we can see from this color map we have a really enormous uh, variation in both in terms of the uh, absorption wavelength uh, the value of lambda, but also in the rotary strength, where we see along this axis really broad distribution of rotary strengths. And significantly, even the sign of the rotary strength can invert uh, for this transition. And so this is an instance where simply taking the optimized structure and calculating the rotary strength and uh, absorption energy and assigning some sort of line width, and this is this x indicated here, might not be particularly effective at predicting the solution uh, thermally populated uh, spectra of this molecule. Uh, and so it seems as though rotary strength is not particularly well described by simply the uh, optimized structures of these molecules. And thermally average simulations in explicit solvents might be a means to get more realistic uh, distributions of these transitions and uh, could be in the future a strategy to uh, determine absolute stereochemistry of molecules uh, using calculated ECD spectra. So to summarize the features of term turbomol, the key advantage of using term turbomol is that we can form long time scale QMMMD simulations. And so we can use either pure or hybrid DFT functionals uh, or even uh, correlated wave function methods uh, such as MP2. And we can do all these methods using large basis sets. So we don't have to restrict the size of our basis set in order to still do extended MD simulations. And in, we've presented a number of results using actually quite large triple zeta basis sets. We can also use the free energy calculation methods in CHARM to calculate relative solvation free energies. Uh, and so uh, in these examples, we calculated the relative solvation free energy of magnesium and zinc in explicit solvent. Uh, and so this avoids having to use an implicit solvent method or, and, or the harmonic oscillator approximation and kind of the limitations that are inherent to these methods. We can also calculate the excited state properties of molecules uh, in, again, uh, at finite temperature in an explicit solvent. And so we can get configurationally average absorption spectra uh, and also look at the dynamics and emissions, emission spectra of long-lived excited states. So we can do adiabatic MD simulation assuming that the uh, molecule will stay within an excited state for the time scale of our simulation. And lastly, we've demonstrated our use of electronic uh, uh, calculation of ECD spectra using charm turbomol. So you can see some examples of the input files uh, that are provided on our GitHub repository here, rally group slash charm turbomol examples. And in these examples, we show the configuration for this QM polarizable MM simulation of uh, magnesium uh, in water. Uh, also, the free energy perturbation calculations of magnesium to the zinc transformation and the QM MMD simulations uh, of the excited state properties of indole. To end, I'd like to acknowledge support from our uh, the University Memorial University of Newfoundland the Research and Development Corporation of Newfoundland for an Ignite R&D grant, the NSERC Postdoctoral Fellowship and Discovery Grant programs, 
and computational resources were provided by the ACENET and Compute Canada Consortia.